The 1960s slogan was a rallying cry against the establishment, and nowhere else was the man more entrenched than in the world of art. Like, literally, it was a male-dominated sphere with century-old gatekeepers. In opposition to the institutional art world, working-class art flourished with street theater, folk music, pop art, you name it. Art was being done everywhere by everybody, regardless of how much money they had. This art revolution led artists like Andy Warhol to exclaim that, in the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. Warhol didn't actually say that, it's been misattributed to him, but still, the idea was a powerful one, that by subverting the hierarchical structure of the old world, everyone was now an artist. Everyone would get the chance to bask in the glory of fame, a shot at being seen. Years later, Apple's 1984 commercial came out and it was a watershed moment in advertising. Alluding to Orwell's dystopian novel, the Macintosh was presented as an empowering tool for individuals against a sea of conformist drones. At Apple, we're trying to balance the scales by giving individuals the kind of computer power once reserved for corporations. The message was clear. The $2,500 Macintosh was a tool for liberation, and the public ate that shit up. Apple began leaning hard on the empowerment angle, specifically with empowering creativity. If you had a personal computer, you had a whole production studio. Tools like GarageBand, iMovie, and Final Cut were joined by third-party apps from Adobe to make the personal computer the quintessential tool for creators. But it wasn't until the release of the iPhone that the final piece of the empowerment puzzle fell into place. Now equipped with a movie camera in the palm of your hand, big tech made the dreams of revolutionaries decades prior a reality. Everyone really could be an artist. But the chance of power to the people had long been forgotten. This was no longer a movement, just power to people. So what does this have to do with YouTube? You've probably heard by now that some survey a few years back found that YouTuber was the number one dream job for kids. And while this probably says a lot about modern parenting practices, I gotta say, I don't blame kids for dreaming. While being an influencer has all kinds of negative associations to it, there's another title that I think describes it better for me and thousands of others. Creator. While vague, playing off of creative, creator encompasses the wide array of work it entails. It's writing and storytelling, it's art, 3D modeling, photography, and videography. It's a creative job through and through, and it's one of the few creative careers left. The most recent figures estimate that about 2.7 million jobs have been lost in the creative economy as of 2020. That's jobs for musicians, artists, and designers just poof, gone. Not only have we been losing creative jobs in the millions, but those jobs are being sought after by more and more people. From 1991 to 2006, the number of bachelor's degrees conferred in visual and performing arts increased by 97%. Over the previous 15 years, it had increased by 0.1%. As one of the few creative outlets available to the regular person, it's no wonder that a career in social media, but YouTube in particular, is coveted by so many. A 2005 study found that more than one half of all teens had created media content, and roughly one third of them used the internet to share it. And that was in 2005! I wouldn't be surprised if the number had climbed to 99% of teens creating and sharing content online. Tech companies like Google, TikTok, and Instagram enjoy an endless supply of young, aspiring creatives who throw themselves at the almighty algorithm in the hopes of making it. But here's the thing, few of them actually do. There are over 51 million YouTube channels, and of those, about 15 million can be considered active content creators, you know, posting videos and having subscribers. Fellow small YouTuber Morjax attempted to crunch the numbers and see how many of them even make minimum wage. By his rough calculations, a mere one-third of 1% 1 of creators are able to earn a full-time minimum wage. You heard that right! 99.7% of creators don't come close to making it. Now, other outlets peg the success rate closer to 3%, but however you slice it, the numbers are pretty depressing. The 1960s activists dreamt of a world where everyone could be an artist. 
And now it seems everyone does want to be an artist, but not everybody can. Of course, we'll never know the extent of the number of YouTubers who never make it. It's not like Google will release the numbers. Keeping the dream alive is part of the business model. It's YouTube. It's all about the brand called you. That's the title of a 1997 article by writer Tom Peters that ignited the popularity of personal branding. One look at the first sentence gives you an idea of what it's all about. Big companies understand the importance of brands. Today, in the age of the individual, you have to be your own brand. Here's what it takes to be the CEO of Me Incorporated. Tom Peters is also known for popularizing the phrase, everyone has a chance to stand out. And it was joined by the likes of Crush It! Why now is the time to cash in on your passion? The late 90s and early aughts were all about you, you, you. And this was sold, like the Macintosh before it, as empowerment. After all, big brands were engaged in ruthless branding and marketing campaigns. By focusing on selling and marketing yourself and your talents, you could get a leg up in the industry with the competitive advantage that sets you up for success. If people treat themselves as a product, then they can beat the corporate world at its own game, turning the power of branding around to personal advantage. But there's a flaw in the logic. If companies already treat us as products, treating ourselves in the same terms doesn't outmaneuver business culture, it only submits us further to its logic, its demands, and its mode of relations. Personal branding, or what it really is, self-commodification, is a tricky game. If I make what the market values the measure of what I value, then non-instrumental relations, obligations, and commitments lose priority and significance for what I am and what I do. We see the effects of this self-commodification and internalization of market values in so many creators. One Reddit poster put into words a question that I've felt for a while. Why does it seem like every content creator on the internet has depression? As a profession for creatives, some amount of mental instability is built in. But take the anecdotes of creators like Colin and Samir who opened up about the effects of comments and the public's approval of their content on their sense of self and their self-perception. Being a creator is uh, is definitely a like psychological exercise, <laughs> primarily because you dis you have made this decision to uh, commodify or productize yourself. No matter who you are, whether you're a creator or not, you're thinking about yourself, right, and how people perceive you. There's also numbers that literally value self, right? Like there's yeah. there's viewership numbers, there's ranking numbers in the YouTube studio, there's dollar numbers and brand deals and those num those numbers are associated with your worth mm -hmm. sometimes even worse i mean i'm not the first one to say this but i find comments sometimes to be much worse than yeah. a view metric that is the spiral of like you know deep um obsession with with like uh how others are perceiving you which is the whole like it's largely what we're doing being public figures, business owners, creatives, and more all wrapped up into one, the difficulties associated with YouTube are certainly unique, and they're multiplied by the precarious nature of the gig economy. The term precariat has been used to refer to workers self-employed in jobs like Uber and DoorDash, and it applies just as well for YouTubers. While YouTube is the most creator-friendly by far, it still fails to provide economic security to the creators who keep the platform running. You can never be sure that the almighty algorithm will bless you on your next video, and with how competitive the market is, you can't afford a break. If you slow down, you disappear. So, self-commodification can involve neglecting relationships and aspects of your life that can't be monetized. It's not unusual for content creators to be putting in 50 to 60 hour weeks, and that's not including the time spent letting ideas marinate. Content creation can be an all-consuming grind. When you add in the fact that most creators on the platform have a day job and create on the side, it can feel like you're stretching yourself to the absolute limit. Ignoring the lives of your loved ones pass you by as every waking moment is spent creating. The nature of YouTube work can also be incredibly isolating. It's not like you're in an office with a team working on a collective project, you're spending your time working alone, editing for hours to propel your brand. Turns out, focusing on you, you, you can be lonely. No wonder so many creators over the years have absolutely burnt out. 
And inevitably, when an apology video from a creator crying their eyes out about how hard YouTube has been on them, the comments are littered with viewers skeptical of the reality of creatorship. YouTuber is a dream job. How hard could it really be? You need to be humble, thankful even. After all, things are way better than they were before, right? Until very recently, a handful of generally wealthy people controlled nearly all forms of mass communication, from newspapers, televisions, magazines, books, and so on. The so-called culture industry ran creative industries top-down, and if you didn't fit the mold, you didn't get to play. Today, the creative market has been democratized. Sure, it's really hard to get your 15 minutes and keep it, but that's a quality for you. So quit complaining. As long as you focus on making good videos that you love, people will watch. At least, that's the story we tell ourselves. As Peters wrote 20 years ago, everybody has a chance to stand out. But by definition, not everybody can. As Molly Crabapple, writer and visual artist, remarks, it's easy to say that if people are just good enough, work hard enough, ask enough, believe enough, then they will be successful. But it's a lie. It's THE lie. We always hear of the success stories, but hardly ever hear about the defeats that far outnumber them. If only one third of one percent of YouTubers make it, then there's a lot of them. Take Moore, who's been uploading perfectly viewable gaming content for years and has yet to cross 69 subscribers. A year ago, he wrote, I've been stuck between 20 and 30 subs forever. Just hit 31. I keep in mind that this content I'm creating isn't wasted. Eventually, a video will pop off. And when it does, all this other content will be ready on my channel for new and potential subscribers. Which, after uploading for years, it's kind of delusional to think any of those videos will ever be seen. Another commenter writing an inspirational post reads almost like satire. It took me 10 years to finally have a breakthrough, and it could take you 10 years, but it might just be your next video and you'll never know unless you make it. 10 years of grinding overwork for a morsel of a payoff? Is that really the odds we're working with? It definitely seems so. If you dig beneath the highly curated recommendation feed, you realize there is a deep sea of content that no one will ever watch. Billions of videos sitting on servers collecting digital dust, hours of work that are fruitless, content with no one there to watch. I started making videos with a wave of other leftist video essayists and I've seen so many of them just fall off the platform. For every one creator who made it, I can name 20 that came and went without so much as a whimper. And as a small creator, talking about this topic inherently means coming across as whiny, and I really don't want it to, I love creating and don't intend on stopping anytime soon, but these are the only conclusions we can draw from what the numbers show. Participation in social media was sold to us as liberation, but it often amounts to nothing more than exploitation. Participation and exploitation. Two sides of the same coin. And yet, here you and me are. Me creating and you watching. If you're planning on embarking on the journey of content creation despite the odds, good luck. You're gonna need it.